But those are the folks that I uh, haven't seen in a little while. And culminate in a blessing in worship in November. Please RSVP to me by October 15th. Our choir shares an act of praise to Mamina. Send me, Almighty God. Join our voices together with all those around the world who are gathering this day in praise of God. Let us lift this call to worship. Rejoice, people of God. Rejoice with your kindred throughout the earth. Celebrate the life within you and Christ's presence in your midst. 
Rejoice, people of God. The Holy Spirit is not bound by space or time. We place ourselves in the service of God. We have come to be blessed and sent by the power of God's Spirit. Rejoice, people of God. Rejoice at the table of remembering. Our opening song is based on a Jamaican folk song adapted by Doreen Porter with lyrics by poet Fred Kahn. It was first sung in 1975 at the World, Council's, World Council of Churches Assembly in Nairobi. In body and in spirit, let us rise and sing and shout for joy. <coughs> standing, I say to you, the peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. Let's try it in Swahili. You know, I just learned uh, from Rosemary Manchester's book that one nice thing about Swahili is all the vowels are constant, so it's relatively easy to pronounce. So I, I looked up, may the peace of Christ be with you, and also with you, and it goes like this, Amani ya Cristo iwe nawe, and you respond with Na pia, na wewe. Amani is the word for peace. Amani. Amani ya Cristo iwe na we. Na pia, na wewe. Okay, now just where you are, turn around, and try it out with somebody near you. You can try the leader part, you can respond with the response. Amani ya Cristo iwe nawe. Na via na we. Amani. Hi, good to see you. Fist bump. What's your name? I'm Nikki. How about you? Hi, David.
but today is a special Sunday, Communion Sunday. Does anybody know why it's an even more special Communion Sunday? Any guesses? Anybody? Anybody else? Can you guess? The whole world is celebrating. The whole world is celebrating Communion. It's World Communion Sunday. So just to help us learn a little bit more about that. I have a few things. I was going to share this ancient poem with you all. And this poem is, this is a, Christians around the world have been saying this when we do communion at different times um, for many, many years. So I'm just going to share this and then we're going to, we'll explore it a little more. So the poem says, as this piece of bread was gathered over the hills, and then was brought together and made one, so let your church be brought together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. So let's, ex let's explore that a little more. Okay, so I have some things. Does anybody know what we have here? Yeah, Alex. Wheat. Yeah. What, is that what you were going to say? Yeah. And what do you think happens? We gather up all this wheat. Maybe this came from all over the world. We could ask Kathy. <laughs> Kathy might be able to tell us where the wheat came from. What do you think happens if we were to grind this up into like really, really small, make it really, really small? What do you think would happen? into a powder. We just happen to have some here. This is just a small little jar of flour. So all of this, all these tiny little grains from this lovely little powder. And then what happens, what can this become next? We mix it with some other things. Yeah. Bread. Yum. Now I don't actually have bread. We have corn tortillas here with us for communion, which is another wonderful. Can you still hear me? Yay. So today, I was thinking when we take communion, we can think of all these different grains. Like, can you imagine how many grains do you think are in there? 100? A thousand? Yeah, I think there are. I don't even know how to begin counting all these grains. All these grains, all of these have been come together and they make a bread that we then eat. And people all over the world are doing this and gathering up all these grains. And this is one way when we do this, when we share this meal together, gather up all these grains in the bread. We're also gathering up all of God's love and sharing that with one another. And today we're sharing that Especially, we're remembering that we share that love with people all over the world. So I wonder, as we take communion a little later in the service, so we all live in California, what's another place in the world that you can think of that today when you take that piece of tortilla, when you take that bread, that you could think about and just remember that you're sharing love with that place? take communion, we're going to think about all of those people in all of those places and in everywhere else. 
in the world. So let's just take a moment, and I'm going to read this, this poem one more time, and that'll be our prayer that we share with one another. So I just invite you to, however you like to pray, maybe close your eyes or look up at the trees or look at the flower. And we remember today as this piece of bread was scattered over the hills and then was brought together and made one. So let your church be brought together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Thank you, God. And amen. The gospel reading this morning is from the same gospel that we've been following these past few weeks. So here's a pop quiz. Which gospel is it? Mark. Mark. Okay. Some of you have been following that. We're, we're at week six in a 12-week walk in the lectionary through the gospel of Mark. This is the portion of Mark where Jesus has now um, defined what it means to be Messiah which includes going on a trip to the big city of? The big city of? Starts with a J. It rhymes with Jerusalem. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. Big trip to Jerusalem with the, with the uh, disciples. And so these are stories on that, on that journey. It's kind of a travelogue of sorts. And so here in chapter 10, Jesus is traveling and crowds are gathered some of those in the crowd uh, are Pharisees, those experts uh, in the law. They're probably the closest affiliated group with Jesus himself. Jesus may himself have been uh, a Pharisee of sorts in the sense of being within that branch of the tradition. Um, so here's a story about some Pharisees seeking to test Jesus as he travels from the 10th Chapter of Mark, verses 2 through 16. Some Pharisees came, and to test him, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about the matter, and he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Here ends the reading of the gospel. These words speak the power of life, and they may be trusted. Amen. Amen. And a thousand all men.
This battery is about to go. I'm going to preemptively switch over. We're still in the awkward stage of our <laughs> pandemic worship, aren't we? <laughs> Embrace it. I've been celebrating weddings this weekend. Really at two ends of the spectrum. On Friday night, uh, Brooke and I went to a friend's uh, wedding party. The Wedding was uh, not done with a lot of flair. They uh, joked that it was a destination wedding, and what they meant was they walked out onto a cliff with some friends, and they said, mm, let's do it there. <laughs> and then they uh, gathered in Petaluma with their friends about around a big table and celebrated and told stories and made connections among their family members. It was day one of their marriage. And then yesterday, I went uh, to celebrate with uh, Garth and Norma Watson, their 50th wedding anniversary. <laughs> Garth is sleeping in. Oh, is he here? Okay, there he is. There he is. <laughs> um, and uh, you should ask Norma about her dress. Uh, they were, maroon was the color. And uh, was it like satin or something like that? It was. It was shiny, it was beautiful, and Garth just looked so dapper in the big, this is 1971, big red collar on the shirt. Um, so the other end of the spectrum, and congratulations uh, to both of you. Um, so I've been thinking about weddings and marriage. I, I've not done a lot of weddings since I began here just over five years ago. I counted, I've done four. Not a lot. I think part of the reason is that a lot of people do have destination weddings to Sonoma County and they're in a gazebo at a beautiful winery and they have a friend be the, uh, be the officiant. Um, and then again, we've been in a pandemic for a year and a half, so a lot of things have been put on hold. Also, um, marriage and the idea of the, the, what we have in mind with a wedding doesn't work for everyone. There are different modes that speak to people's, um, their own unique understandings of what it means to make a commitment to one another. And it's not always using the language of marriage. It's not always a wedding the way many of us kind of think of that as, as it is framed. Um, so I've just, I've just thought about that, the, the diversity of experiences uh, with weddings. The last wedding that I did was actually for members of this church, Leslie Bagley and Stephanie Camara, they might be watching online right now. If you are, hello. Um, it was a beautiful outdoor setting where their family and friends came together under some beautiful uh, oaks just over the county line in Marin and uh, celebrated. Um, I've had to learn to love weddings. I, it used to be I liked memorial services more. And the reason is this, that at a memorial service, there's a whole range of emotions that are possible. But at a wedding, everybody should probably be feeling more or less the same emotion, right? Yeah. Happiness exactly. for the couple who are coming together. But I've learned to love. I've learned to love it over time as a, as a pastor because there's such a uniqueness in the two people and in their families and in their friends and in their communities coming together. There is a, a deep, a deep uh, richness. It might seem odd to be uh, hearing a text about marriage and divorce on World Communion Sunday. I, I, I have been pressed to find the connection, but I think I've made it. 
but not yet. You see, as Jesus is journeying along, uh, he's having a number of different experiences. And in this passage, the experience is that some of his peers, these Pharisees, have uh, sought to uh, test him, to trap him. And it is a very loaded question. They ask him, is it uh, allowed, is it legal, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now let's notice a few things about this. Do you notice how patriarchal the question is? The, the woman in this question has no agency whatsoever. So they frame it in, in, in a very patriarchal way. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And secondly, it is a very loaded question because of John the Baptist. Do you remember the fate of John the Baptist? He was criticized for uh, speaking up against Herod's marriage to his wife, and his wife was the divorced wife of Herod's brother. And he spoke up against this, and he was put to death for it. So when we hear this question of the Pharisees asking Jesus this question, there should be a sense of uh, ominousness to the question. There is, there is threat here. This isn't just an innocent question about the law. It may well be that they're trying to trap him in the same way and, 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 and see the same fate that John the Baptist had. And so they ask him this question, framed in a very patriarchal way, and then uh, they quote scripture, right? Because Jesus said, well, what did Moses say? And so they quote scripture and they quote Deuteronomy. And there in Deuteronomy 24, it says that a man can divorce his wife if he has found something unpleasant about her. <laughs> and with that quote, they expected to kind of prove him, you know? Have you ever been proof texted before? Where somebody's quoted back some scripture and they quote it to you as if it's the end of the story? That's what's happening in this conversation. They point to Deuteronomy and they say that um, a man can do this if he's just found her uh, displeasing to him. Do you notice the power imbalance in this patriarchal law? Where the man has all of the agency and the woman has none? And also in the family structure, who else doesn't have any power? The children. So the Pharisees respond with Deuteronomy 24. But if you've been traveling with Jesus this far, so far along this journey, you know that he is going to look beyond this power play toward those who are left vulnerable. Why were women and children left vulnerable when it came to divorce? But be because a divorced woman couldn't remarry. It was ruin for her and very often for her children as well. The man had all the power, and it wasn't just the power to dismiss, it was in a sense, a very real sense, an act of violence. Because it put her completely out of any source of well-being and livelihood. She became destitute and would often take to other forms of trying to survive, often prostitution. So these cavalier Pharisees, quoting De Deuteronomy 24, and Jesus says, well, he doesn't dismiss it altogether. He says, well, that's there because of your hardness of heart. You guys who think you're entitled to be able to dismiss her once she displeases you, you need a rule like this in place to keep you from doing that. But before they can get another word and before they keep arguing with him, he now sets his teaching and his response inside a larger frame. You see, that's the problem with proof texting. It usually pulls out one text from one place and seems to make one point, but, and that is the end of the argument. But Jesus continues the argument by placing Deuteronomy 24 in the larger frame of Genesis 2, the origin story of creation and of humanity. He says that God made them in God's own likeness, male and female. In other words, God is multiple genders. 
That's the nature of God's likeness. And humans are created in that multiplicity of genders to be in relationship with one another. So within this larger frame of Genesis, Jesus is raising up a larger vision of what it means to be in relationship. First, with marriage. That marriage is not a power play between the men with the power and the women with no power, but marriage is more like a mutual covenant entered willfully by two parties who seek to be one another's partners, to enhance another's life, to journey the road with the other, and to, to help another uh, step into the fullness of their humanity. Now we know today, because it's touched every single one of our lives, that divorce is just about as common as marriage, yes? And I think that within this larger framework of Genesis 2, we can affirm that if a marriage uh, enhances the full humanity of both partners, it is worth sticking it out. But if it diminishes one or the other or both of the partners, then indeed, in that framework, divorce must be permitted. If not, in some cases, and I know I'm going to get at least one amen for this, divorce is, can be a blessing, yeah. a freedom from a toxic relationship. I don't, I don't know that we say that enough in church. <laughs> we kind of have it in the back of our heads that, oh, everybody really should just get married and stay married. Not if it harms. And I think we can support people not only in marriages, but in other forms of committed relationships and covenant of relationships. I think that's part of our calling as a church. But it's within this larger frame of Genesis 2 that Jesus brings up. That this is not a transactional relationship. This is not a relationship where we're jockeying for power. It is a relationship that could be described as a certain kind of communion. Calm union together as one. Mutually. Isn't that a description of the church itself? To be together as one mutually with God. Not a transactional relationship. Not a consumer relationship. Not a power play. But a, a relationship of people who belong to one another as peers, as siblings, as kindred, as one in Christ. So this test on this particular day, this uh, test of Jesus, which he then places in a larger frame, actually gives us a larger frame within which to understand World Communion Sunday. That we, the church, are not about uh, competition and one-upmanship and bragging, but rather we belong to each other in a mutual relationship where there is give and there is take. And we have to be honest that there are some times when our relationship with the church is more harmful than helpful. And that is why some of us have sometimes left. It's happened in our own church in this past year. There have been folks whom we've loved and been in relationship with who have decided, I just can't do it anymore. And for my own part, my response has been, I respect that. I love and bless you as you go, and I look forward to a future day when we can uh, perhaps come together in a new way and begin this relationship again. But it also speaks to the relationship of our church in our own setting here in Sebastopol with the wider church throughout the world. For too long we have acted in North America like we understand better, not just about church, but about politics and the economy and culture and so forth. And this is not going to work anymore. The church is not growing in North, North America. Where is it growing? Africa, South America, Asia. That is the Christian church of the future. 
And we here in North America, if, if there are any Christians left, which I hope there are, we're going to need to have a new stance, a new sense of openness and receptivity to wisdom from places throughout the world. But not just for the sake of the survival of the church, but for the sake of the most vulnerable. And so at the end of this test, where Jesus has placed Deuteronomy within the frame, the larger frame of Genesis 2 and this mutual relationship, Jesus gestures to the children that are close by, those who are usually discounted, who have no role in the economy, no authority, no power whatsoever, and he pulls them into the center, and he says, you gotta flip it around, because unless you approach the kingdom of God the way these little children do, with openness, honesty, awkwardness, play, little comments of wisdom, goofiness, silliness, cry when you're sad, laugh when you're happy, yell when you're angry, be fully yourself. Unless you approach the kingdom of God like this, I, I'm afraid you will never get there. And so it is my joy, I hope it's your joy too, whenever our children gather here, especially close to this table, reminding us what it means to be in relationship with others. Trusting, open, eager, ready to learn, ready to say yes. In this way, communion changes everything. Psalm 8. In Psalm 8, we hear these words, the heavens and the earth, the sun and moon and stars, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, all things belong to God, and to God all things return. As the chancel choir shares its gift of music, a song of praise to God the Creator, and as the ushers come to serve among us, I invite you to return to God a portion of the resources God has provided. We will be receiving gifts for the flourishing of the church and the neighbors in need special offering. Let us worship God with our offering.
dedications. Lord God, you have entrusted us with the works of your own hands. Now we return these gifts to you with thanksgiving and praise. Use them all for your glory and for the good of our world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please be seated. As we come to this table, we join our hearts in prayer, and we remember especially Corrine Calway, our beloved, beloved Corrine, and we hold her whole family in prayer. We think of Joan, who's home from the hospital, and we welcome with love baby Emma, grandchild of John Heddle and Julie Smith. Let us pray together. God, in the person of Jesus, you teach us that even when our hearts are hardened, you are there, inviting us like children into your arms. For you bless all your children in every time and every place. Thank you for being open-hearted and open-armed, even when we are not. So often, we are keen to pull others into taking our point of view. God, help us to see your light and your love shining through differences. Soften our hearts with acceptance and grace. For as people around the world join at this table on this day, it is a great celebration that we can be quite different and quite connected at the same time. Thank you for being bread that connects our world. God, we pray your comfort will cover those who are grieving and lonely, heartbroken, ill, or anxious. Bring relief, we pray, to those who suffer especially refugees and those displaced by war, poverty, and disaster. Surround the isolated with your love. Give strength to the caretakers. Call us into community to serve not our own, but one another's best interest. Turn the hearts of political leaders in the United States and around the world to see through your eyes and walk in your ways. God, help us to have the strength to pay attention to what we need to this week, to be able to say yes to compassion, to say no when our limits are reached, and to be tender with ourselves when we need rest. Gracious God, we thank you for filling our bodies, hearts, and souls with the bread of life. Amen. Amen. I invite uh, Joanne Matson to join us here, just next to Pastor Lacey. We will now prepare for the sacrament of Holy Communion. In a moment, servers will come among you. Today, we commune with a simple corn tortilla that is gluten-free. In solidarity with most people of the world who eat simple meals made of local produce. And we share in our cup water with salt a taste of tears as we weep with all who suffer.
table of bread and cup is now to be made ready. This is the table of company with Jesus and all the little ones whom he spoke. This is the table of sharing with those who hunger and thirst for justice, with those who fast with intention, and with those who do not have enough to eat. This is a movable feast celebrated with relentless longing and expectant joy in the presence of the one who suffers among us while showing the way to fullness of life. So come to this table, you who have much faith, and you who would like to have more. You who have been here often, and you who have not been for some time. You who have tried to follow Jesus, and you who have failed. Come, it is Christ who invites you, in the company of all creation, to meet him here. Let us pray. Hear us, O Christ, and breathe your spirit upon us and upon this bread and cup. May they become for us your body, vibrant with your life, calling us, astounding us, and raising us to serve. And as the bread and cup which we now eat and drink are changed into us, may we be changed again into you, bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh, loving and caring in the world. Amen. Amen. You remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was gathered with his beloved community for a meal. And at table, he took the bread and he blessed it. And he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, at the end of the meal, Jesus took a cup, gave thanks, and blessed it. Baruch and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and drink, for this is my very life blood poured out. I shall not again drink from this cup until I drink it anew with you in the coming kingdom of God. Ministering in Christ's name, we offer you this bread and this cup, the gifts of God for the people of God. All things are now ready.
bathroom. Yeah. There's one like over there. It's over there. Yeah. By the bike rack. Okay. Said it's over by the bike rack.
join your hearts in prayer with this prayer of thanksgiving. Our prayer from workers in communities, soup kitchens, and neighborhoods in Lima, Peru. God, food of the poor, you have given us a taste of the tender bread from your creation's table. Bread newly taken from your heart's ovens. Food that nourishes and strengthens us. A bread that makes us human, join hand in hand, working and sharing. A sacrament of your body, a shared bread that makes us a family, your blessed and wounded people. This we ask and more in the name of Christ, our bread, who teaches all disciples to pray by saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. God Almighty, the love of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with all the world now and forevermore. Amen, amen, a thousand amens. Thank <laughs> you. 